All right. Um, so, either good or bad, you've got me again this morning. <laughs> um, so today we're going to look at um, John Flavel, who we, Philip spoke about a couple of weeks ago, as you might remember, one of the Puritans. Um, and one of the uh, papers or books that he wrote uh, was about keeping the heart, um, which is really good. And so I thought today I'll just do a quick summary of that. And there's, um, I think everyone's got a handout, if that's useful, if you want to grab one. Uh, just to fill in as we go. Um, so, and it's probably no coincidence, but um, Bevers and myself didn't plan this before time, but this morning's sermon, I thought, talking about um, the heart and um, the importance of that, I thought was just a really good way of kind of filling into this. So, yeah, it worked out perfectly, <laughs> I think. Um, so before we start, just a quick uh, summary again, uh, who is... Uh, John Flavel, so he was born in 1630, lived until 1691. Um, he uh, kind of started preaching in 1650. He uh, was kind of ordained. Um, he continued to minister in Dipsford for uh, six years. Um, and then uh, kind of after that, obviously he's written quite a lot of papers and books that is worth reading. There's lots of uh, things that... Um, and then he passed away in 1691. Um, so, definitely. Um, so, this uh, paper in particular around keeping uh, the heart is really about how to maintain your love for God. Um, and if you think about it, um, it all really starts with the heart. So, John kind of talks about how this is probably one of the most important things as a Christian. Uh, for you to do, um, because this is really where it all starts. Um, why is it so important? Because, as John says uh, in Proverbs 4, verse 23, keeping our heart with it all diligence, for out of it are all the issues of life. So it really is almost the root of all things. Um, so the way you, what you think about uh, your actions is all driven out of uh, what's inside your heart. Um, and from this text we're giving a warning, but then also a, a simple reason. So the warning is, keep our heart with all diligence. If you don't keep your heart uh, pure and true on God, then how can everything else flow on from that be uh, right? And for out of that, all issues of... Uh, are all the issues of life. So, if your heart is not pure or in the right place, then what you think about, what you do, what follows on from there, uh, you know, you can't have a really bad heart, but then try and do good things out of that. Um, and as I was preparing for this, I thought, you know, even if you think of when little, uh, you know, from the start of life, it's really the heartbeat that starts life. Um, and in John's kind of writing, he also says um, it's the last thing that lives when you die. Um, so it's really like if you think about um, even when you know little babies are born, when you go for that first scan, they always listen at the heartbeat to tell you that there's a li little living person in there. Um, so everything really starts with your heart, even physically, but also spiritually in your life. Um, and then just amazing as we read in Ephesians 3 verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that ye being rooted and grounded in love. Um, so God says that he lives in your heart, um, which is why it's such an important thing for us to talk about. Keeping the heart with all diligence, as John kind of says in his paper, the keeping and right managing of the heart is every condition is one great business of a Christian's life. Um, so it's really a focus of a Christian's life is to look, look and monitor uh, what's going on in your heart. So there's six things that he talks about uh, as kind of particulars or um, of what I've done in the uh, outline is what are the six important habits as a Christian for making sure you're keeping your heart. Um, and then there's 12 
almost warnings or dangers for us that we need to think about and be aware of as we think about this. So, um, so if we think about the uh, six important habits, so the first one I've called um, is the observation. So the frequent observation of the frame of the heart. This is almost like a heart monitor um, that you need to have on you all the time. You need to understand the condition of the heart and continue to monitor the heart on a regular basis. So you need to understand that as a Christian, um, what's inside your heart. Um, the second one, which I thought uh, ties in nicely with that, is the humiliation for heart evils and disorders, awareness of realization of the sinful heart, and that only Jesus can save it. Uh, he kind of says in the, in the paper that if a small dust get into your eye, it will never cease twinkling or watering till it has wept, till, till it has wept out. So the upright heart cannot be at rest till it has wept out its troubles and poured out its complaints before the Lord. This is almost like your uh, life support on your heart monitor. The third uh, habit is to purify the heart. Earnest supplication and instant prayer for purifying and rectifying grace when sin has defiled and disordered the heart. For a heart to love God more, to hate sin more, to walk more evenly with God. You need to love God more than you love sin. You need to love God and hate sin more. Um, for, your, for your heart to be pure. The fourth one I put there is um, engage. The imposing of strong engagement upon ourselves to walk more carefully with God and avoid the occasions where the heart may be induced to sin. So how do you keep your heart pure? You have to be connected with Jesus and God. And you need to walk with God. It's not a one-off thing. It's a that's why John talks in his book about it's a keeping of the heart, not you know putting the heart in one place and then set and forget. Uh, it's important to know that you need to walk with God to keep your heart pure. Number five is about fear, a constant and holy jealousy over our onto onto hearts. He that will keep his heart must eat and drink with fear, rejoice with fear, and pass the whole time of his sojourning here in fear. And this is the fear of God that we need to keep in our hearts. And the last one is around focus. So we need to fear God, but also be realizing of God's presence with us. And setting the Lord always before us, keeping our focus on God to maintain our, our hearts. So if these are the six habits, if I can call it, of keeping the heart. What are the dangers to us as Christians and sometimes often ways in which we, we stumble and our hearts to uh, go in the wrong direction? So the first one John talks about is pride. The time of prosperity when providence smiles upon us, when we are most at risk of feeling proud and earthly, this is often when we forget the Lord. When things go really well in our lives, you know, think about uh, people in life when they get lots of money, um, you know, when things go well, business goes well, Family goes well and life is just good. That's often when we forget the Lord. But the scripture tells us that it's easier, says Christ, for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. God values no man the more for these things. God values man by out but God values no man by outward excellencies but by inward graces. They are the internal ornaments of the Spirit, which are of great price of God's sight. God despises all worldly glory 
and accepts no man's persons. But in every nation he that feareth God and worketh righteousness is accepted of him. God is not about money, uh, uh, all the successes of this world, but about uh, you loving him. So pride is a danger for us. The second one is about adversity. Keep, with, keep it all with diligence from turning against God. We need to remember that God is always in control and His plan has a purpose. Every affliction in our eyes is still part of His plan and for His kingdom. It only happens upon His permission. Um, I thought this tied in so nicely with Bevis uh, preaching this morning. We will get trials and troubles in our life, um, but it's all part of God's plan and God is in control. We're encouraged not to let those times be a reason that our hearts uh, get distracted from God. While God allows affliction on His people, He has not taken away His loving kindness for them. So while you might have affliction in your life, you need to remember that God is in control and is not doing that out of uh, not loving His people. It's all for His good. The third one, and this one is quite uh, relevant, I think, if you think about our time these days. The attack, but the attack on church. When the church, like the ship in which Christ and His disciples were, is oppressed and ready to perish in the waves of persecution, then good souls are ready to be shipwrecked too upon the billows of their own fears. God permits nothing out of which He will not ultimately bring much good to His people. How can we forget the text? If God be for us, who can be against us? So even though it might feel like the church has been persecuted, we are reminded, similar to the previous point, that God is always in control and He won't allow what is not part of His purpose. Don't be distracted and forget that we have received through Jesus. Still there is much matter of praise for, for electing love. Has distinguished through common providence, has not. And while prosperity and impunity slay the wicked, even slaying and adversity shall benefit and save the righteous. Number four is about worldly fear. Um, the time and danger of public distraction. This is about when we fear the things of this world more than we fear the evil of God. There might be times that you might feel afraid of what's happening around us or the fear of what's happening in this world, but John in this book encourages us to know that how can you fear this world if God, if you are, if God is with you and God is always in control? See, the mistake that this world makes is they fear this world, but they don't fear God. Pretty dangerous. The lot, uh, number five, uh, desires and needs. John calls this the time of outward wants. Would you know then how a Christian may keep his heart from dis distrusting God or repining against Him when outward wants are either felt or feared? God often reduces you to necessities. God does not put you in a position without promise. Whether this is uh, you know, financial needs or things that you think you want or need in your life, but maybe God thinks you don't need it. Um, God provides and always provides. While it might feel bad now, it could be worse and it will get better. Don't let your heart be distracted by desire and needs. And number six kind of extends that point around uh, general distractions. John talks about this is our duty. Our hearts must be closely watched and kept when we draw nigh to God in public, private or secret duties. Um, 
For the vanity of the heart seldom discovers itself more than in such times. We need to set aside time to avoid distractions of this world. We shouldn't let our lives be so busy that we don't get time to study the word or pray. I remember a few weeks ago uh, we spoke about the importance of private prayer. This is really what this point is about. It's that relationship and conversation with God. Number seven. <clears throat> so this one's about attack, but this time not on the church, but on you personally, as a Christian. The time that we may receive injuries or abuses from men. Remember to forgive rather than retaliate. It is a good person. If if it is a good person. I thought this was quite interesting. So he talks about if you get an attack from a good person, there will be a tenderness in the conscience at some point. So we need to understand that we're all sinful. And often, sometimes, people closer to us might um, disappoint us or hurt us. Um, but if they're really a good person, at some point their conscience will catch up with them. If it's a bad person, we need to exercise pity as they are actually in a miserable state. Think about the lost. Um, and John talks about, as a Christian, that's why we need to be in a position to forgive. We need to expect, as a Christian, that you will be attacked by this world and by people. Number eight talks about the great trials when we overrate ourselves, we think that we are treated unworthily, that our trials are too severe, thus we cavil and repine. As Christians, you should have such thoughts of yourself as would put a stop to these memories. You should have a lower and more humiliating views of yourselves than any other one can have on you. Get humility and you will have peace, whatever you, the trial the trial might be. Don't ever think that a trial is too big uh, for God and remember that He's always in control. Number nine is an important one about our own temptations. The hour of temptation when Satan besets the Christian's heart and takes the unwary by surprise. I'm always reminded of a uh, saying that I always remember about Satan and sin, who will always take you further than you wanted to go. He will keep you there for longer than you wanted to be there, and the damage will be bigger than you ever thought it should be. The secrecy with which you may commit sin is made us into induced compliance with temptation. The tempter intuits that this indulgence will never disgrace you among men, for no one will know it. This is about uh, secret temptations. But recollect yourself. Does not God behold you? Is not the divine presence everywhere? What if you might hide your sin from the eyes of this world? You cannot hide it from God. No darkness nor shadow of death can screen you from his inspection. The prospect of worldly advantage often enforces temptations. Perhaps the smallness of the sin is urged as the reason why you may commit it. Thus, it is but a little one, a small matter, a trifle, who would stand upon such necessities. But is the majesty of heaven little too? If you commit this sin, you will offend a great God. Is there any little hell to torment little sinners? No, the least sinners in hell are full of misery. There's no such thing as little sins or just sinning for a little while. We need to be careful and protected from temptations of this world and protect our hearts from those temptations. Number 10 is all about doubt. 
the time of doubting and spiritual, spiritual darkness. Everything which may be an occasion of grief to the people of God is not a sufficient ground for their questioning the reality of their religion. Whatever the ground of one's distress, it should drive him to God, not away from God. All Christians, I think, go through a time when you might question, where is God in this? But we shouldn't doubt it, rather look to God uh, to help strengthen us through those times. Number 11 is about Christian suffering. The time in suffering for, relig for religion is laid upon us. Now, whatever may be the kind or degree of your sufferings, if they are sufferings for Christ's sake and the gospel, spare no diligence to keep your heart. It's not in the public's interest of Christ's end cause inf infinitely more important than any interests of your own, and you should not prefer his glory and the welfare of his kingdom before everything else. You might be suffering for being a Christian at work in your own life, but you should always remember um, that um, no, what, whatever may be the kind of degree of your suffering, if they are the suffering for Christ's sake and the gospel, spare no diligence to keep your heart. Did the Redeemer neglect your interest and think lightly of you when for your sake he endures sufferings between which and yours there can be no comparison? Did Jesus hesitate and shrink to back off when he endured the cross, despising the shame? And did he, with unbroken patience and constance, endure so much for you? And will you flinch from momentary suffering in this cause? It's a good way for us to think about when we suffer as Christians. How much did Jesus suffer to save us? And the last one is about sickness. The time we are warned by sickness that our disillusion is at hand. When the child of God draws nigh to eternity, the adversary makes his last effort. And as he cannot win the soul from God, as he cannot dissolve the bond which unites the soul to Christ, his great design is to awaken fears of death, to fill the mind with aversion and horror at the thoughts of dissolution from the body. Death is harmless to the people of God. Its shafts leave no sting in them. Why then? Are you afraid of that sickness, in particular if it may lead on to death? Here John encourages us that even in sickness, in great sickness, we shouldn't fear. Consider that the happiness of heaven commences immediately after death. That, happens will, that happiness will not be deferred till the resurrection, but as soon as death has passed upon you your soul will be swallowed up in life. On the contrast, it's usually the non-Christians who fear that time when they're really sick or they might be lying on their deathbed. Uh, John says, the pure heart of a Christian should not be fearing in that time. That's not the time that you sh should, your heart should be distracted by the fear of sickness or possible death. It should be the time that you should be reminded of what's to come. So hopefully those um, six habits and twelve uh, important dangers to remember is a good way to think about how to keep your heart. And John talks about a couple of final thoughts about how to, about keeping the heart. Firstly. It is the hardest work as a Christian. 
to repress the outward acts of sin and compose the external part of thy life. Is no great matter. Even carnal persons, by the force of common principles, can do this. But to kill the root of corruption within, to set and keep up a holy government over thy thought, to have all things lie straight and orderly in the heart, this is not easy. So it's a reminder that even though it's easy to write these things down on a piece of paper, it's not easy to maintain, and therefore it takes a lot of hard work. Um, and we can't do it ourselves. We need to trust in Jesus and ask him for help. It's not only hard, but the second point is, it's constant work. It's not a set and forget. The keeping of the heart is a work that is never done to life and this world is ended. So, back to the point of it might be going well, it might be going good. Don't think that you can stop thinking about your heart and working. It's constant work. It's back to that point of making time to be with God, to pray, read His Word. Make sure you protect your heart. And then lastly, it's the most important business of a Christian life. Without this... We are but formalists in religion. All our professions, gifts and duties signify nothing. God rejects all duties, how glorious soever in other respects, which are offered him without the heart. He that performs duty without the heart, that is, head headlessly, is no more accepted with God than he that performs it with a double heart, that is, hypocritically. So it's one of the hardest things to do. We need to do it ongoing. And it's one of the most important things that we can do as a Christian. And I'll end there. Um, might just uh, pray while we finish up. Lord, we thank you that we can gather today as a Christian family um, and spend time as a uh, Bible study group. Think about the great work from John as he uh, helps and reminds us of the important things of Christian life. Lord, we uh, pray that you will help us to think about our own hearts, um, Lord, and we pray that you will help us to keep our hearts Lord, it's amazing to think that in the scripture it talks that God lives in our hearts. Such an important part of a Christian's life. Lord, we pray that you will help us to think about the six habits to maintain our hearts. But more importantly, also think about the dangers in our everyday life. Of how Satan is trying to harden our hearts and take our hearts away. Lord, we pray that you will help us to think about what this means for our own lives and how we can apply it. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.